Welcome everyone, uh, and thanks for joining me tonight on uh, this this webinar. Um, wasn't quite sure actually if it was going to happen because we're actually getting a, uh, a nor'easter here in the northeast where I am in New York, and they were predicting a lot of snow and heavy snow and winds, and so I was a bit unsure as to. And I even got an email from my internet provider saying that um, to expect maybe some internet outages, but. Um, Luckily, it hasn't happened, and the weather seemed to get a little better as the day went on, so I decided to go ahead and and uh, go on with it. And uh, so here we are. Hopefully, we can uh, keep everything <laughs> up and running for the next hour or so. Um, first, again, I want to thank you for joining me. I really appreciate this opportunity to share something with you that um, I hope you find valuable and helpful in your photographic journey. Um, it's great to be engaging with um, everyone publicly again on the internet, uh, as it were, after a tough couple of years. We all know what that's been like. Um, but even though I've sort of uh, taken a step away from engaging online and, um, uh, and, and being more um, present, um, I still have not stopped engaging with the, with the creative process. In fact, I've gone even deeper into... Uh, trying to do things that are meaningful uh, creatively. Uh, and that is really a part of my uh, creative journey uh, in photography now for almost 20 years. And as an artist in general, if you count my musical background for most of my life. Um, and so that, that's that been, uh, it was a great, I think it was a, a good break for me to sort of re-energize. Those of you who get my newsletter know that I've spoken about this in the past. But uh, I do feel very motivated and passionate now to um, share as much as I can about the things that I've learned, new things that I'm learning. It's always an exploration. Um, I've been still very active photographically. I've also been painting for six or seven years. And those things have really coalesced together and uh, opened my mind uh, to a lot of things that um, I'm excited to, uh, to kind of practice, but also share. Um, this is uh, a, a part of the, uh, an, ex an expansion of that. It's a uh, I thought of it as a new series of webinars that, uh, based on my experiences of teaching and identifying areas for growth amongst my students. One uh, uh, gratifying thing that I've had is working with lots and lots and lots of students over the past 10 years, and I've noticed certain things, certain patterns, certain, certain areas that uh, a lot of students struggle with, and I think those are areas for the most amount of growth. And I don't think it would surprise you to say that those areas aren't more equipment, more gear, better cameras, right? I mean, of course, those things are great and they're fun to have and uh, they're enjoyable. But that, that, those are not the areas that I see students struggling with the most, whether it's me noticing or whether it's me asking. Um, they always seem to come back to the same kinds of themes. Um, and there are several, but the one at the top of the list, I have to say, is composition, right? Is this idea of using the camera to compose something that we see in the field um, in a way that conveys something to the viewer. And I want to emphasize that, um, you know, there are many kinds of art, there are many kinds of ways of using photography expressively, and it's fine if some people just like to use the camera as a way to um, show the medium, what the medium can do. I'm mostly interested in expressing some kind of story, some kind of emotion, something that I'm feeling that I want to share with others, my particular way of seeing the landscape. And so that's what this whole, um, well, my, what my whole approach is based on, and, and, and by extension, the webinar tonight. So it's just my opinion, of course. It's not the only way of composing. It's not the only approach to composition, but it's a, an approach that has worked for me. Uh, that I've shared with lots of students, that has, I've seen work for students, and I think it's also based on a lot of tradition, a lot of uh, things that have worked for a long time, for many centuries, uh, more of a traditional approach, again, trying to communicate with as many people as possible. So tonight I'm going to share some thoughts, some ideas, some concepts, uh, because there's a big conceptual framework around composition, which I think is important to at least have a grounding in uh, and then we'll look at some specific examples of compositional principles through some image analysis, mostly my own images, but some others. Um, and again, I just want to stress the importance of having an open mindset 
uh, that goes for me as well. I always try to keep open to as many things as possible um, with the caveat that, you know, as the old, saying says, as the old saying says, don't have such an open mind that, you know, your brain falls out, or so to speak. There are some principles that we can use as guides uh, that have stood the test of time. Before I get started, um, just want to say that in the right-hand column uh, on in your browser, uh, at the top there are two tabs. One is uh, the place where you guys are all chatting, um, and then there's another uh, little icon that looks like a circle with a with a, a person in it or a face. Use that tab to ask questions. I will not be looking in the chat for questions because there's just too much going on. Um, but in the questions tab, post your questions in there. I will not be answering the questions as soon as I see them. I will stop, you know, somewhere in the middle of the presentation to answer some questions. And then towards the end, I'll stop again and I'll answer as many questions as I can. All right. Um, I just see somebody here from Chile, from Arizona, from Georgia, Poughkeepsie, up the block, Brazil, Scottsdale, Florida, New Jersey. So thank you all for showing up. It's uh, quite an honor, as I said. All right. So let's get started. So let's let's I want to start with the basic question. Why is composition so difficult? Or why do so many of us find it so challenging? Why is it the thing that seems uh, to require the most amount of uh, uh, creative energy? And I don't think it's because uh, it I mean, I know it's not because we can't tell the difference between a good and a poor composition, particularly when we're looking at other photographs, other artwork. We all have this intuitive sense of, you know, like what we like and what we don't like, what speaks to us in some way, right? So when we connect with um, a good photograph, right, like an image by Ansel Adams, or, you know, with a good book, with a good uh, piece of music, whether it's a, a, you know, a symphony or a jazz musician improvising, um, we can tell what, you know, we know what that feels like. We kind of, we can appreciate that. We can read these images very easily, okay? But as an artist, as artists, and I consider all of you artists, and by that I mean uh, that we are engaging in this act of creating something that is uh, original, something that expresses ourselves, we need to understand the language of composition. Um, and we need to use it to convey a story. We need to use it effectively. We need to understand its grammar, uh, and we need to use it fluently. Just like a musical composer, we can listen to music, but in order to compose music, we need to understand the language of music, or a writer, or a painter. And so this language isn't unique to photography, right? It's also expressed in all visual art, as I mentioned. So you don't need to be a good painter to appreciate a great landscape painting by Albert Bierstadt, one of the Hudson River School painters, but, and, so, and so we can learn immensely by studying how they constructed their compositions because they're using the same sort of uh, compositional principles that we can use in photography as well. It's a different medium. It's a different way of, let's say, creating the medium, but the final result is read by the viewer the same way. And so we want to understand how they effortlessly lead the viewer's eye, but you can still explore. You can still see something new each time you look at the painting. Now, the best pictures reach viewers on an intellectual and an emotional level, all right? They go beyond simply just documenting the landscape, and they evoke some kind of emotional reaction from the viewer. I mean, I, I think that's what we all want. When you show your pictures to someone, and they connect with it, and they say, wow, that feels so nice, I wish I were there, that's a great feeling. And I, I don't think it's a great feeling because we feel great about our photographic uh, you know, um, skills, it's because we feel like there's a connection. They're getting what we saw. They're getting what we felt. And that human connection is very powerful. If you pay close attention, though, you'll notice that when you're out in the landscape, okay, you may think that you're perceiving all of the landscape in its entirety. You might think that you're seeing everything. But your visual system, what's happening in your brain, okay, is selecting and filtering out the information based on what you find most interesting. There's a huge amount of brain processing involved. Um, in contrast to that, a camera is, you know, kind of egalitarian, if you will, right? It treats every part of the frame equally. 
And therefore, the more you include, the more things you put in your picture, in your composition, the more you dilute the idea uh, and the more diluted your story becomes, your, your ideas become, your emotions. Not to mention that a picture is a two-dimensional representation of reality. It isn't, you know, it isn't reality. It's definitely not reality. Just consider all of, this, all of the senses that we engage when we're out in the landscape. We're not just seeing, but we're hearing, we may be smelling, we may be, you know, we're really experiencing it in a full three-dimensional experience, and then we try to capture with a picture, which is a two-dimensional flat sort of representation. So in order to maintain the viewer's attention and communicate an idea, you need to really focus on composition and composition that has a limited focus, a less is more approach. And that combined with good design principles used in a skillful way. So we need to be clear about what we're interested in and then decide what to leave in and what to leave out to eliminate, you know, what to eliminate in order to strengthen the primary intent of the image. So here's an example, very quick example of a limited focus. Okay, here's, a, here's an image that I made recently. This, this was an image where I, was, I thought that I was capturing what I was really interested in, but then I continued to make more photographs and what I realized that what I really wanted, what was really attracting me was this combination of layers and tones. Uh, and when I made further images, I reduced what I was capturing to a very simpler version of the image, converting it to black and white even emphasized more what I was looking at, which was this combination of textures and lines, uh, this sort of um, visual, interesting way of looking at the picture and also representing this kind of dynamic between the sky and the ground. So I want to start with some essential skills that I think can help you make, uh, help you make better creative decisions about what to include and what to exclude. Because it seems to me like that, that seems to me, that seems to be like, you know, the, the, one of the biggest things that we're doing, which is how much do we leave in, how much do we take out? And in order to do this, we need to understand um, what's entailed and, and how we put things together in the frame. So the first thing you need to know is what attracts our eye um, and using this to establish a focal point or center of interest. First, you need to know precisely how it is that a viewer is going to look at your picture and what's going to attract their eye, where are they going to move through the image. Okay, and this is definitely, these are all skills. So by skills, I'm very specific in that these are all things that you can learn. You just need to train yourself uh, to learn these things and to see them and to practice seeing these things. Second thing is knowing how to inject energy or dynamics by using movement and or leading or suggestive lines. So energy and movement is how we get the viewer to move through the picture, how we use variation, how we use differences in one, from one part of the picture to another so that the eye is encouraged or suggested to move through the image. You've heard of this as leading lines uh, or directional energy, but there are many, many different ways to do this, but it's important to know in a basic way how to do this because that's what's going to help you to get the viewer to move through the picture. Uh, third one is knowing what kind of distractions can lead the viewer's eye astray. So just as important to know how to lead them to where you want them to go, you also need to know what might distract them, what might push them away from your center of interest, or worse, the worst thing is to what might make them leave the picture altogether, leave the frame. Uh, and you almost never want to do that because you want the, the viewer to maintain interest in your composition, in this rectangle. Knowing what tools are available to achieve these goals. Uh, these tools are the elements and principles of visual design, the grammar of our visual language, right? So the tools are not Lightroom and things like that. We can utilize Lightroom in order to build up these uh, elements and principles of visual design, but you have to know what those are first before you can apply these other tools. Same thing with lenses and cameras and so forth. Knowing the right focal length is knowing what's available to you as a tool in the in, in you know in the field and what you're looking at and then being able to strengthen that through the use of a limited focus by again using a, you know a lens or or a longer focal length etc so a strong composition relies mostly right 
as I said, on deciding what to leave in and what to, and what to leave out of your viewfinder, deciding how those parts will relate to each other and how they relate to the four sides of the picture window itself. Okay, and here's a beautiful example of that by the great photographer Edward Weston, where not only is the interior of the image carefully considered, but look at how all four sides of the frame are placed perfectly in the right places to engage you on throughout the entire picture, particularly the diagonal from the bottom right to the top left. This is a language, and I can't stress that the analogy enough uh, to language, right? Being fluent is the, in this language, like, you know, using grammar in a language. The better you are at grammar, the better you can speak sentences. The better you can speak sentences, the easier it is to communicate to the listener what you want to say. And then when we get better and better and better at it, we go from, you know, uh, regular speech to poetry, right? Um, learning to see light and shadow instead of objects with labels, right? A, a big part of looking at the landscape and seeing what's going to work involves not looking at specific things, not naming things, but seeing the play and the pattern of light and shadow and how you can use that to create a compelling composition. I'm going to share a couple of quotes because uh, I love quotes. A successful picture is one in which a feeling or a mood is created. This feature is read instantly and often subliminally by the viewer and supports the message or subject of the work. Uh, and this gets back to what I mentioned before, that even though your viewer, any person that looks at your picture, uh, may not know the principles of composition, but they can subliminally read what, you know, something in the image that, they, that resonates with them, that attracts them. And this is something that's innate. I'll come back to this in a minute. Another quote, a, a photographer's work is given shape and style by his personal vision. It is not simply technique, but the way he looks at life and the world around him. And this, I love this quote in particular because it puts the onus back on us as photographers instead of on the equipment. If it's about the equipment, everyone has the same equipment, everyone has the same access to the technology. But if it's about your personal vision or the way you look at life, the way you see things around you, okay, a, blue sky, a pale blue sky may be boring to one person and that's fine, to you, it may be something that you really um, uh, uh, connect with and you find a way to incorporate that into your composition so that that blue sky then becomes something that you appreciate and hopefully you can pass that on to your viewer. Here's a, uh, a picture from one of my favorite photographers, Galen Rowell. Um, this definitely Galen Rowell's style. If any of you know Galen Rowell, this is his style, very rich and saturated, very graphic and dramatic, but it's hit the way he saw the world. and and. This is uh, in Yosemite, but look how how much or how little of Yosemite he's capturing to really convey this powerful sense of the landscape. It's it's a very 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 small limited focus of, of that entire scene. I'm sure. So I want to share. Um, three basic principles that I stress and I talk about in all of my workshops. Many of you who have read my books or taken my workshops will know these, but uh, I never stop reminding them uh, to my students and I never stop practicing them myself because I think they are a good, at least a good, uh, a good foundation or a good guide. And then from there you can branch out into um, whatever other things you want to add in terms of your own work. But these three core, core principles uh, are questions or principles that I try to incorporate in every image that I make. And I look, uh, I look for these things in any other image that I am uh, you know, giving feedback on or critiquing or trying to analyze. The first of these is, um, are you or is the image, is the composition leading the viewer in some way? Okay, again, this could be through uh, some kind of movement, directional energy, is the image dynamic versus static? If the image is static, it means that the viewer is not really moving throughout the picture and it's impossible to lead them anywhere. And so we want to avoid static images. Uh, leading the viewer doesn't mean that you are specifically guiding them on this, you know, on this um, path that they can't deviate from. Of course, the greatest pictures are the ones where the viewer can explore wherever they want, but there's definitely a strong suggestion as to where they should be looking. The second principle is, uh, does the image or the composition have a center of interest, right? This could be a major event 
Okay, a major event is something in the picture that's happening, something that's happening that that's what the picture is about. It could be a dramatic sunset. It could be a storm. It could be a beautiful morning with light just streaming across a meadow. But that's an event. That's something that the image is completely about and there's nothing else that is interfering with that. Of course, it can also be a, a, a specific focal point. You know, you have a tree or something or a flower in the foreground. And if that flower is front and center, then that can be your focal point. Um, it could also be like the event. It could be a mood or a feel. Maybe your image or your composition is about just a feeling and an, an emotion. For example, my images tend to be or have, have I should say, transitioned over the many years from being less about a specific thing. And this is not good or bad, just my own um, just my own um, uh, journey have transitioned from specific things to more inner feelings, inner dialogue, this feeling that I'm having, this emotion, that something that I'm responding to. And finally, does the composition exhibit uh, harmony and balance? I used to call this unity, but I've changed the wording a little bit to harmony and balance because uh, I think it's maybe a bit more descriptive. Uh, is the composition unified, right? Um, does it have distracting elements or unnecessary complexity? Any of these things are going to break the feeling of harmony and unity, right? So a few examples of this, okay? Um, here is the image, and then I've overlaid some compositional cues here. So the red line, okay, and that's how your eye is being led through the picture, all right? There is a strong leading line, which is just a simple kind of C curve. Um, there are additional leading lines or suggestions with the green. So the sky, again, kind of all leading into the central point of the image. But there are, there, there are, there's enough information around the image to contribute to this unifying whole. And what I'm trying to create is just the feel of being on this still quiet lake early in the morning before sunrise. Here's another example where, again, I'm using... A, a, a very strong leading line or a very strong suggested leading line from the bottom right. Yeah, because you can see the red line swirling through the image. Again, a basic S curve. Um, and the greens are also, the green lines suggest also areas that, uh, that, that make the image more dynamic versus static. They also balance from left to right so that there's always something in the image you can explore, something you can, you can see and, 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 uh, and kind of uh, enjoy. But at the end of the, you know, at, at, at the bottom line, it's really just this sense of the grandeur of this landscape and the light all the way from the distance uh, coming down right basically to where I was um, standing and how it kind of just pulls you in and creates this sense of depth. Here's another example where um, the trees and the way they're positioned create depth in the image and they allow your eye to want to or they 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 suggest to your eye that you move through the composition because the trees are different shapes different sizes different intervals between them and then the light which is darker in the foreground and brighter in the background creates the sense of depth so that you feel like the image moves in uh, makes it more three-dimensional so just to review all right. Again, we want to make sure that we're leading the viewer through the image in some way, that we're creating some kind of uh, energy through the picture, directional energy. We want to make sure that we have a, a center of interest. Again, I call this an event, a focal point. A center of interest could be, as I said, um, a specific area in the composition, like a particular thing in the landscape, or it can be just a feel, a mood, atmosphere. And finally, um, are we, is, is, is the image unified? Is it harmonious so that you want to stay inside the picture and everything feels like it belongs? It, there's nothing in the picture that feels like it doesn't belong or it's sort of not contributing to the overall picture. If you're unsure that something, uh, about something not contributing to the composition, more than likely you, 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 you'd be better off leaving it out, <laughs> right? Um, now, all of this relies on a basic understanding of visual perception, um, how the human eye reads and sees and perceives things. Uh, and this is incredibly important, so I want to go over some of those 
things right now. I'm going to call them visual cues. All right, and a cue uh, from the dictionary, I wrote it down here, right? A, a cue is a feature of something perceived, uh, so a feature of something perceived that is used in the brain's interpretation of that perception. So in other words, it's something that we perceive and the brain interprets it in a certain way, and that's what a cue is. And, and in composition, there are many, many powerful visual cues. I'm going to go over some of them, uh, the most important ones, but there are many important ones. Um, but here are a few. One is um, contrast. I put contracts there. Sorry about that. But it's contrast of values. So contrast in different values. Contrast of color. Contrast of shapes and lines. So meaning, you know, the difference differences between uh, different lines, different shapes, their sizes. Same thing with color. Same thing with values. So let me show you some examples of that now. By the way, all of these cues are hardwired, right? We're hardwired to see these cues. Uh, we don't need to learn these things. Um, we need to learn how to utilize them, but we see them instantly. Um, it's part of the brain's visual system that I mentioned before. And if you, use, if you learn how to use these cues, it makes composing an image not only um, more, a lot more effective, but it also makes it more fun because you're able to see these things much more easily. So by contrast and values, um, I'm showing you here a value scale, and a value scale is just showing you um, difference in values from white to black. And the value, by value, I mean how light or dark something is. It doesn't have to be black and white, it could be in color, but it's just a, a, a question of how light or dark something is. And the bottom there, you see two colors that are more or less equal in value because one is not darker than the other. If I made you know, one of those colors much darker, then that would be a different value. So values are independent of color. Value is just how light or dark something is. But values are incredibly important because our eyes are attracted to areas of higher contrast. That means areas that have um, a bigger difference in value. So if you look at the, the area on the left, there's contrast there in value, but not as much as the area on the right where we have those dark, almost black squares with um, light backgrounds that contrast value is much higher and our eye is attracted to that, uh, to those areas, are going to be attracted to those areas much more uh, strongly than areas that are similar in value. Also notice how the stronger values, particularly uh, with the dark colors, seem to come forward more than the example on the left where they seem to blend in in terms of like a three-dimensional space. So again, value has a way of telling us how far away or how close something is to us, and it separates things out uh, in the landscape from a three-dimensional standpoint. All right, so contrast and value is very important. The next one is contrast, contrast in color. Uh, color theory is uh, a very deep subject that I cannot get into here uh, in its totality. Maybe I'll do a webinar just on color because it's a fascinating subject. Um, but the important thing to, I think the, the, the most important thing to know is that dashed line. And that, da that dashed line that I put there separates the color wheel, the RGB color wheel, which is what cameras use and what we see out in visible light, red, green, and blue. It separates the color wheel into warm and cool colors, relatively speaking. And that means that uh, warm colors tend to come forward. You've all heard this, or, or some of you may have heard this in composition. Warm colors tend to come forward. Cool colors tend to recede into the distance. And so um, that's a good contrast to be aware of. Um, a more precise or a more specific contrast is on the color wheel. Colors that are opposite each other are complementary or opposites, which mean that they will um, be more pronounced next to the other color. So as an example, if you imagine um, a meadow of sunflowers and you've got a blue sky behind it, well, if you look at the color wheel, the sunflowers are the yellow and the sky is blue, and that is a direct, they're directly opposite. So they're going to create the most amount of contrast, which means those sunflowers really stand out from the blue sky. Now imagine the same sunflowers with, you know, uh, let's say red rocks behind them. Well, if you look at the color wheel, the yellow sunflowers, yellow and orange, are next to each other. Those are analogous colors on the color wheel, and they're going to not stand out against each other. They're going to kind of blend in. So your sunflowers won't really blend or stand out in a composition when they're, when they're placed in front of, a, of an orange or, or, or even a light green background as if they're placed behind a blue background. So just, just a general principle to be aware of. Um, warm and cool colors, very important. 
And then contrast of lines and shapes um, is the last one that I want to uh, mention. And I got a series of, of uh, slides here to, sh to show you some of this. So here everything is the same. The spaces in between, um, let's say these are trees or, or bars or whatever you want to call them. They're the same thickness. Everything is the same. So it's very static, very balanced, very symmetrical. Here we've got some intervals now. We've got different spacing and pacing, if you will, between the elements. So we're, we're generating a little bit more contrast now between those three shapes. And so our, our, you know, our forest, if you will, is now a little bit less static. If we change the length of the trees and we add like a little horizon line back there, now we're starting to get a sense of depth. Uh, we're starting to get this front to back um, cue, visual cue, um, and there are different intervals, right? So even more interesting, and our brain is already interpreting these things as, oh, this is more three-dimensional now. Now we've added a few more things, which is we've changed the thickness of those lines, or our, we made our trees thicker. We made the trees different, like you actually would see in a forest, right? Um, and the elements are different angles. So now we have a lot more variation, a lot more contrast between the intervals, the lengths, the visual weight, the angles, etc. Now we're creating a lot more uh, interest, and our brain is interpreting this more and more as having depth, as having, uh, as as having. Uh, more energy, okay? And then finally, this last one, we've introduced some color. I've just put in some tones here, but now we really get a sense of how the elements are changing even more, right? Notice how the gray and the black negative spaces that's behind the trees, that's around the trees, they're, 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 they're different sizes and proportions, right? And this variation of the lengths of the visual weight of the angles, that makes for the most interesting composition and so if I were to, if I was going to apply something like this in the forest if I was standing in front of a forest and I just had chaos I would try to limit my field of view to where I could find slight variations like this in a small area and that's what I would be focusing on because that really will then engage the viewer versus you show them everything um, and it's very very difficult to make an, in an image that is uh, compelling Here's an example by uh, the great Russian painter uh, Ivan Shishkin, right? Here he's using a combination of contrast and values. Okay, notice how the background mountains are a lot, a lot uh, uh, lighter. The stuff in the foreground is darker. Okay, that's a value contrast. That's a color contrast. Notice how the foreground is warm. The background is cool and kind of grayish. And notice the variation in shapes, right? All the different size shapes. Um, Instead of the shapes being the same size, they're all different sizes. All of these things put together create a lot of energy, a lot of rhythm, a lot of movement through the picture. And even though you don't see, let's say, particularly a, an, a specific leading line, as it were, you can see how your eye wants to kind of move through the image, and then you can kind of go off uh, and explore areas of the picture. But there's certainly something that he wants to, um, that he wants to convey here, and that's that beautiful warm light against the cool, dark, kind of foreboding background. Here's another example of contrast of lines and shapes, okay, resulting in a sense of rhythm, or, uh, you know, I call this visual rhythm. The trees in the foreground are much darker and bigger than the trees in the back, so that creates a sense of depth. It doesn't look flat. And then the greens in between all have different sort of shapes and color, if you will, and so that creates an interesting sort of play through the whole image, but still, you're engaged with the, basically the three groups of trees, the left, the middle, and the right-hand side. The more you understand visual perception, right, these visual cues that I, that I mentioned before, the more you understand how these cues work, you can utilize them to create movement and excitement in your pictures. You can be more suggestive in, composi in your compositions, which creates more depth. So here we see variation in the sizes and uh, contrast in the, so contrast in the shapes. We see contrast in the color. Again, cool and warm in the foreground. I'm sorry, cool in the foreground, warm in the background, kind of the reverse of usually what we're thinking about, which is warm in the front and cool in the back. Um, and 
Uh, and there's also this pattern that sort of starts off kind of slow at the bottom and, and builds up as we get towards the top of the picture. Here's another example of a very minimal scene, just a small area of a, of a forest. And not only, are, not only am I trying to convey here a sense of just interesting rhythm between these trees, but the sense of depth. And so those blue lines that look like train tracks, right? That was my way of conveying a sense of depth. You're being pushed into the picture or the picture conveys this sense of space. And the way I can generate that, the way I use that, the way I use the visual cues, or at least attempt to, is by placing darker values in the foreground. Oops, sorry, let's go back one. Darker values in the foreground, lighter values in the background. That creates a contrast of value, uh, contrast in shapes, because the shapes are bigger, uh, closer to the, you know, to the camera or to the viewer and smaller in the distance and um, contrast again in color, kind of warm in the foreground and then it gets cool in the fog in the distance. Another way that um, shapes can contrast uh, throughout the composition is what I like to call active versus passive shapes. And so active shapes have patterns. Active shapes create a pattern or a texture, a more detail, right? So active is what's really engaging the view of these rocks, right? They have detail on them, they're shiny, they're very present. Passive shapes lack detail or texture. And so here's kind of an overview of what I mean by that. The areas that are in red are the active shapes and the other areas are passive. And see here you can see the balance between the active and the passive areas. If the whole thing is filled with active areas, then there's it makes it much harder for the eye to move through the picture. But by allowing some space around the active areas, the passive areas sort of reinforce the active areas. And that creates a sense of movement and a sense of rhythm. All of this, by the way, to the viewer, they don't really read any of this. The viewer sees the picture, and I'm hoping that they just imagine the sound of the ocean, right, moving in, the, shore, the, the, the surf moving in amongst these rocks. That's really what I'm trying to convey to them, the smell of the, the, the shoreline at the ocean with the fog in the distance and not really knowing what's out there. That's what, that's what I'm feeling, but I have to get into the, the, the mindset of these visual cues of understanding uh, composition and design, understanding values in order to convey this to the viewer. Here's another example of um, contrast, active versus passive areas. The bottom of the picture is active, the top is very passive, contrast and color, and there's definitely a way that your eye is kind of led into the picture. And then once you're led in, then after that, you can sort of explore on your own. I don't really take you anywhere else above because the bottom is so strong that you will keep returning back to the detail and the texture in the bottom. The top part of the image reinforces the texture. You see, had I put texture in the top, the bottom would have lost its strength. So it's, a quite, it's all relative. It's all a question of how we balance things in the picture. Um, here's another example of a contrast, contrast in color. Uh, a lot of color in some areas, but not a lot of color in others. And in, in fact, it's mostly just dark and shadows to again force, not force, but to suggest to the viewer that the beautiful sunrise just kind of blanketing uh, the landscape and the rest was just kind of, everyone was sort of just enjoying uh, the moment. One thing to keep in mind is um, what format you use, so horizontal versus vertical. Um, there's more directional energy horizontally in a horizontal format, but if you want to have vertical energy, or you think that your composition will benefit from being vertical, uh, that's going to make the viewer, or that's going to make the shapes move more in a vertical orientation. So here's an example. Here's an image where my original attempt was horizontal, but I found that what I was really attracted to or what worked better compositionally was um, going for a vertical orientation where I could then limit the amount of trees in the picture and by limiting the amount of trees then we can be then I can be more specific of exactly what I want to show. Here's another example of starting with the horizontal but I realized that what I really was interested in was just the middle little piece there of the picture because that's where I felt the, the content of the image was contained or the, uh, the, the, you know, 
the strength of the image was just in this little spot there. And by going to a vertical format, I was able to strengthen that aspect of the image there. So I'm going to go through uh, a bunch more images now and um, just highlight more of these principles for you. So the leading, uh, the viewer, center of interest, and harmony and unity, and show you visual cues, how I'm using them. Again, the only way I, I can, the only way I can imagine reinforcing this for you is by showing you examples. The way I came to learn these things and to understand these things and to apply them was pretty much the same way, by uh, looking at lots and lots and lots of pictures and trying to understand what made them work. Um, and then by practicing myself and trying to go out and see things in a different way, looking at lots of pictures and practicing and getting feedback from others who were uh, more experienced than me and could tell me, hey, you're almost on the right path, but you need, you need to you know, go in this direction. So feedback is very important because it'll tell you when you're on the right track and if you're, if you're making similar mistakes over and over again, that's fine. Uh, but getting feedback will help you to um, correct those mistakes so they don't, don't become patterns and uh, things that you may not be uh, seeing. And at the, end of the, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you um, some tips for that. I want to stop here for a minute uh, just to answer uh, a couple questions that came up. Uh, one is about books um, for reading. Uh, there are lots and lots of books uh, on composition that you can read. Um, as a passionate photographer, I have to tell you that very, very few of the best books I've read on composition are by photographers. Um, the best books that I've read on composition are by painters, to be quite honest, because they've been doing it for a lot longer and... Uh, I guess there's just more time for these ideas to uh, have been written down. But I will recommend, um, I'll send out an email to everyone who registered, and I'll recommend a few books by photographers and also other books just on composition. It doesn't matter really whether it's a painter or whatever, the, the, the principles are the same, and so you'll learn an awful amount by just reading um, and seeing how other people approach the same kinds of things. Um, another question is, are variations in textures soft versus hard another form of contrast that can be used is the hard is the hard texture what the eyes pull to yeah absolutely uh, i mean if you look at this image that i have up right now that's a great example of that which is that the textures in this picture there are textures everywhere but the textures are not all the same the textures in the foreground of the rock in, in the rocks are the most uh they, they are the um uh, the, the hardest texture, they are, they are the richest texture. The textures in the clouds are a lot softer. They're a lot more diffuse. They're there, but they're not nearly as uh, specific as the ones in the foreground. And the middle ground has texture as well. But again, all of it is relative to each other and they're all in varying degrees. So I certainly, yes, I'm certainly using the variation in textures to create a sense of hierarchy or to create a sense of... Uh, foreground to background, a sense of depth. We definitely will uh, um, perceive textures that are rougher to be closer to the viewer and textures that are less rough to be further away. So absolutely textures is a wonderful thing to use when it comes to contrast. Another example is the water example from before where the rocks had a lot of texture and the water really uh, dilutes that texture or minimizes it completely. And that's a great way to emphasize things. If you have texture throughout your picture, it makes it very difficult to create any kind of movement or dynamics. Um, any of you who uh, know about uh, use Lightroom and use the sharpening tool in Lightroom, the masking adjustment in Lightroom is exactly that. It reduces the amount of sharpening in certain areas of the picture to allow to create this sort of uh, um, contrast and texture versus just sharpening everything throughout. Um, two more questions and I'll get onto a few pictures. Um, how often do you use vignetting to lead the viewer? Um, I use it not a whole lot, but I, ha I have used it in the past and it's a great way to lead the viewer. I, I probably use it 95% of the time in portraits. You know, when I'm doing portraits for personal, for myself, my family, that's when I do portraits. You see how well it works in portraits. It can work in the landscape. Um, I try not to use it though because it can look... It can look um, 
I, I mean, my approach is that any editing or any developing or anything I do to the image, I want it to look natural. And if you apply a vignette, it's hard to apply it where it's not noticed, but that doesn't mean that um, you can't use it creatively. And then last question, what type of energy or movement is supported by the square format orientation? Great question. Um, I was actually going to include the square format in my in my slide in my slide with the horizontal and vertical, and then I decided less is more. I didn't want to go too far in that towards that direction. But um, if the vertical form, if the horizontal format, okay, uh, suggests energy in the horizontal in horizontal horizontally, and if the vertical format suggests energy vertically, then the square format is kind of unique because it kind of doesn't really suggest energy horizontally or vertically. It really, it really is kind of uniform in the kind of energy that you'll get on all four sides. And it's unique in that way because you can kind of use it very um, creatively. So the square format is, a lot of people are using it more and more. You see that on Instagram, of course, or at least it used to be on Instagram. Um, so yeah, the square format, it will just be more universal or, or less vertical or horizontal. You can be much more uh, creative with it or uniform with it in terms of like what kind of energy you create. Okay, so I want to get onto a few pictures <clears throat> and show you what's happening here. And let me just change my screen here. Okay, so here's a very simple image where I'm just um, using contrast. Here's here's one in texture, textures all through here, and I'm basically leading the eye something like that. All right, and the and the contrast is between the textures and areas that don't have any texture. So in here, in here, in here. But even in areas that don't have texture, right? I got lucky in that there are some little lily pads here that add a little bit of interest. But the idea for me with this this image was just this sort of visual image where you could either see the the reflection of the sky, the water, as the main area of interest, or the texture as the main area of interest. And for me, it's probably the texture because it just has this beautiful feel to it. Um, but the, the edges of the frame are super critical in this picture because the edges, I had to make sure that in none of the edges did I lead the viewer out. And so you see there's dark here from a reflection. This is really pointing you in over here. It pulls you in, of course, and pulls you in here. And that's the most important thing is the edges of this picture have to be uh, carefully balanced and I'm not saying that it's perfect I'm saying that this is the best that I could do at the time using the, uh, the these principles that I'm you know that I'm that we're talking about here's another example of contrast in color or you can see that with warm in the foreground cool in the background and again what I was attracted to in this picture was just the beautiful way that nature can create these amazing beautiful shapes you add some light on it and it's just something that you can look at over and over and never get tired of and so you've got these shapes here with different intervals faster and faster like rhythm almost like a an orchestra building up to the background and then these directional lines here which just kind of reverse back and forth. Okay, so this left and right, left and right. And I think that is what adds interest to an image when you can create this, these contrasts, this variation. Here's an image that I made uh, on an assignment for conservation. I, this is an apple orchard, and these are always, um, I would say the most challenging and the most fun for me because I'm not presented with this pristine landscape. I have to often go into places that are, you know, farms and orchards and things like this where I have to really use all these principles as best as possible and at the same time not let um, create something that is representative of what the uh, the client wants. I can't go too off and create something abstract. They say, well, what? this is an apple orchard. You know, you can't give us a picture of something that people won't recognize. But what I really enjoyed here, what I, what I was able to capture here was, again, you know, simplicity, keeping it as simple as possible, just these two big shapes. Notice how this one, okay, much smaller than this one. This one is bigger. And so that already has a sense of variation and depth because the bigger one is closer. We perceive that that's a visual cue. And then the shadows lead your eye. And then eventually we get here, which 
ultimately is my center of interest. It's the light. I'm always looking for light. And then, of course, when you get super lucky, right, when um, things just work out for you, then you get these beautiful cloud shapes that sort of add a complement to the foreground. So using the sky as a way to balance out the foreground, but enough of a sky where you can still see some blues where there are some active and passive areas. I talked about active and passive. So here's a nice big active area and then smooths out here and it kind of smooths out here, passive areas. And even down in the foreground, the trees are active and the grasses become a little more passive. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned, but I'll mention it now since I'm remembering it. And the reason I haven't men mentioned it quite honestly is because this, for me, has become so second nature. I don't even think about it, but of course it's this. Okay, we all know what this is. And the rule of thirds, right? It's not a rule, but it's a good guide. It's a good way to get your bearings on a composition so that you have a sense of where things are going to work. Notice that I haven't placed things exactly on the third, but they are suggestive, right? This is on a third. This is kind of on a third. The horizon is on a third. And then the clouds. What compelled me to put the clouds here versus up here, down here, or how to tilt my camera? Again, using the thirds and using this nice blue sky on top to create some space for the sky, which, you know, which, which um, if it wasn't because I was on assignment, I would have made more pictures of the sky. So here's another challenging image that I made on an assignment. I showed this before in a forest um, and they wanted pictures of the forest, right? There wasn't really anything on the edge. And so I had to really uh, look for light, look for uh, visual cues that would lead the viewer through and into the picture and also create a sense of some kind of harmony, some unity from chaos. And the way I'm really trying to do that is, again, um, focusing on thirds, Okay, so this is a major point there that leads the eye in, and it's dark on purpose. I'm backlighting on purpose because backlighting allows me to simplify the image. I don't have to deal with texture there, okay? If you backlight the areas that are in shadow, they become passive because I've got way more active areas than I can manage, right? Everything in the, in the top half is active. And so these become passive, it leads you into the picture because your eye is looking at the rim light and then these trees get smaller and smaller as it goes into the back and I'm trying to pull you in and create a sense of depth into the picture. And everything has to support that. So I can't have anything in the picture or try not to have anything in the picture that would distract, that would take away from the unity. So a very narrow kind of feel close to that rock in the foreground without including more things than I needed. I had way more than I could manage, but the light streaming in from the distance, that kind of helped to seal the picture together. Here's another example of uh, more or less contrast and shapes. Again, I'm gonna highlight the thirds because I tend to utilize them a lot in ways that are maybe not so obvious, but again, that's generally you know, how I'm looking at the picture. I'm not looking specifically at the thirds. I'm thinking about regions, okay? So I just think about, you know, I think about this region, the center region, this region, how I can manipulate things in those regions, where I can place things in those regions. And these shapes here allow you to move through the picture and then back down to the foreground. Um, and this energy here or this movement there is the primary one but of course if I can reinforce it on the other side I, de I generally will take advantage of that um, so whenever I can use the corners effectively I will because that helps to create energy and movement here's a very very simple picture from uh, a recent trip in Death Valley very simple picture which I probably don't make oh, I, or I may not have found as interesting without the moon but the moon was there. I had a couple seconds to just take a quick picture um, just to kind of um, get some shapes. But the the shapes are very simple. And here I'm I'm not I'm suggesting the diagonal. Right. I don't have to put this into the into the diagonal. I've already suggested it here. That's kind of 
how your eye is going to read this. Okay, um, and the shapes overlap. It's hard to see maybe in your monitor, but if you were to look at a print, they have slightly different, um, slightly different values. Okay, so the one in the foreground is slightly darker than the one in the background, so that creates a little bit of depth. And then because these shapes are so strong and so graphic, um, I use the contrast in color, if you want to call it that, meaning this beautiful gradient of the sky contrast with um, what is really not much color here at all. And so it really emphasizes the blue. That's really what the picture becomes about. Because I have eliminated all of the colors, the blue color, that blue of the sky with the moon in the background, it just lets the viewer not think too much about how the image is put together and just really just, I'm hoping that it just lets them see it and think about what the experience was like. Um, here's a picture of um, another very limited focus where I was walking through a, um, through, through a forest and it was very foggy all of a sudden some light came through the, the sky, not sunlight, but just enough light to create variation, to create a change in the shapes. And so I, again, I'm using thirds, roughly speaking, and I'm using the variation in shapes and variation in values, right? This is much darker here. This is lighter and then darker again. So this is dark light in the middle, dark on the left. And I'm using that to create movement. Your eye is going to want to go between areas that have contrasts, as I mentioned before, whether it's contrast in colors or contrast in values. And uh, this little accent here, okay, perhaps you could say that's my focal point. Uh, like I said, very rarely do I have focal points, but there is one, this little, just this little branch with these leaves that were that was sticking out into the forest, uh, sticking out into the in, in in that area there, and I just thought that it made a nice, it had a nice shape to it, and I liked the silhouette that it created, and it also connects with some other greens that are here and down here. So it wasn't by itself; it had uh, it created a, a pattern, if you will, and you can see how your eye just kind of moves in this kind of circular motion. That's the idea. Almost abstract, but not quite. You can still identify what it is. Here's another example of using depth in the foreground. So establishing the foreground as a, as a kind of an anchor to create a sense of depth and leading your eye back into the picture. Also contrast in texture, right? This rock here has a lot of texture has the light, and so by slowing down the shutter, I was able to soften the water and create a passive area. This passive area, together with the sky, which is also passive, that balances with the active area of the foreground. What does that do? It simplifies the image, right? By making it simpler, it's much easier for the eye to kind of relax and enjoy moving through this part of the part of the picture, and then returning again to the foreground, um, without anything feeling like it's distracting or pulling out away from the picture. I, there's also a contrast in color. There's a warm light, not a direct light, but kind of a warmish light that was just peeking through the clouds. I don't recall exactly, but I can. I, I'm I'm guessing that this may have been a morning where it was cloudy or the sunlight was coming in and out of the clouds. And when it was behind the clouds, there was no light or there was very flat light. When it was direct, it was very strong. And I'm always looking for those moments where the light has a little bit of diffusion to it. It's, it's kind of soft. That kind of transition period between the sun moving out from behind a cloud, because that's going to give you that warmish light, that softer light that I find uh, more uh, to my liking for the kinds of images that I like to make. That might not be the case for you. That's perfectly fine. If you are looking for something a little bit more dramatic in a particular situation or you're feeling more dramatic, that, that's the key, really. The th thing is, how are you feeling? 
What are you responding to? That's what you have to look for. I am not going to say this light is better than that light. I don't really know what that means, to be honest. All I know is light that allows you to create the kind of composition that you want to create. Uh, it just so happens that light is this magical, beautiful thing. And so when we have beautiful light, we all tend to enjoy that. But it's not a rule. It's not a law. It's uh, something that generally tends to work. Here's another example of an image where I'm using um, very carefully placed differences in value uh, in order to create some kind of movement uh, and design out of this seemingly kind of chaotic area with all these grasses. And so you've got these intervals here, kind of like the mountains, okay, but now we're looking at grasses. So you see it's the same compositional principle. Right, and that's um, where the image gets grounded because your eye always wants to go. Not only does your eye like to see value contrast in values, but one thing that I that I missed uh, mentioning before is that generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, your eye likes to go from areas that are darker to areas that are brighter. So you look out of the shadow, and so whenever you can place shadows. Uh, kind of like the vignette idea. If, if you have a vignette, your eye's going to want to move in towards areas that are brighter. And so these shadows here move your eye up. Same thing here. Your eye is moving this way. Um, and then I don't need, really need a lot of detail back here. All I need is just a little bit of that light that's um, hitting the back of those mountains there. I don't need that, but it, it was a nice little added bonus there. And these really diffuse clouds, which again, uh, create a more passive area versus let's say dramatic clouds, which I think would take away from the foreground. So this is a very kind of soft, kind of serene image, kind of quiet image about this moment, um, which is more or less how I felt when I was there. I couldn't hear anything. It felt amazing to be there. I felt completely connected with the landscape and that's what I wanted to bring or, or convey. <clears throat> One or two more pictures. Um, here's a more dramatic, uh, idea uh, converted to black and white to emphasize the shapes and textures um, to really emphasize the connection between the sky or the clouds and the ground and notice the notice the I would say the differences in the textures um, notice the foreground has a lot of activity but then as we move up it gets simpler very simple and simplest of all in terms of just the shapes that you have to contend with. And so that that sense of movement, of variation, I think is what um, attracts the eye and what keeps you engaged in, in wanting to keep looking at the image. And notice also how those four areas that I just mentioned, they're also different sizes, okay? I specifically did not make the foreground, this area here, I didn't make that the same size as the sky because now I would have had two areas that were kind of symmetrical. Uh, once I was able to see that difference. So just to backtrack a minute, when I'm looking through the camera, when I'm looking through my viewfinder, I'm not saying to myself, this is what I want. What I'm, what I'm doing is I am, I am trying different things. I am looking at the landscape and, and moving my camera around. And while I move my camera around, I will analyze. I will look at what I'm seeing and say, oh, that works, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, I like the way that looks. Oh, I see that now this can be bigger and this can be smaller. Oh, I see now that I'm getting some variation. I am, I am analyzing in real time uh, everything that I'm seeing. And when it starts to move towards something that I know is going to be better compositionally, better design, when the eye can le be led better, when I move a little bit to the left or to the right, and I eliminate something that now I know is not a distraction, I know I'm getting closer to a better composition. And I keep moving in that direction until I, I can't go any further, probably because that I've reached the limit of what I can see at that time. By that I mean the best that I can do then. When I go back a year later, I will do better, hopefully. That's the whole idea. So I bring this up to emphasize that this process that I just explained to you is an iterative, iterative process. It means it's, it's, I'm constantly iterating what I see in my viewfinder. And honestly, it takes like, you know, it takes 
all of my attention. I have to be extremely focused, extremely concentrated while I'm looking through the viewfinder. The reason why this is important is because I don't really have the mental bandwidth when I'm doing this to be playing around with camera settings or to be looking at the LCD preview to see how my pictures turned out, <laughs> whether I like them or not. Because once I do that, then I'm no longer utilizing every part of my brain to try to make composition, to try to make compositions at work. It takes, I think, it, you really have to be focused. And I see that as a, you know, a, one of the areas that I think a lot of students can get better at. I'll mention that in a minute. Okay, here's another picture where, similar to that last one, but there's a, this I would say there's an event, right? The event is this sand that's blowing in um, through the view, uh, that's blowing across the landscape here. And I really liked the way that made this big shape here much more interesting. Otherwise, it would just be this big, dark shape um, that would, I think, dominate the picture. But the sand or this variation in tone, okay, that what I just said, <clears throat> what I just said is the difference between how I used to photograph when I started and how I photograph now. When I first started photographing, I would say that sand and it's the sand doing this and the sand doing that. I don't think that way anymore. I don't see that way anymore. What I see now is a variation in tone. Oh, look over there what's happening with the different values and now that's creating an interesting shape. That's what I think in my head. Now, of course, I'll explain it to you, um, all of you as photographers, as there's the sand, but really it's not sand. It's not about sand. It's about how the elements in the scene are creating variation. It's, it's being caused by the sand, but it could be anything else. It could be fog, it could be fog, it could be smoke, whatever it is. What's important is that you recognize a variation and then you uh, not only recognize it, but try to incorporate that into the composition so that it creates something interesting. Um, that makes these shapes in the foreground a little bit more uh, concrete, more textured, very soft here, and then this sky, which creates these lines. All right, and that's the general movement in the picture. All right, these Z's going back and forth. Not static, which is that, okay, or this. Not as static, but that's still static. But what's most dynamic is these kinds of lines. That's most dynamic. That's why we like diagonals in our pictures because they create more movement through the frame. This one is a nice example of relying on thirds just to get started, just to kind of situate myself and then finding a way to utilize these textures, continue that pattern up into the sky, but then the blue background gives me a beautiful way, a beautiful passive area in which to really make these trees come forward. Uh, and in my mind, or in my eye, in my, in my, in my you know, photographer's eye, and we all have this, Again, I'm looking at shapes. I'm thinking about these shapes, how these shapes are creating or have variation and how this variation creates an interest in wanting to explore the picture. The viewer's gonna say, oh, those wonderful trees or wow, just, you know, what a beautiful scene, whatever they say, I, I'm not sure, but I'm hoping that they feel what I felt, which is, boy, how lucky I am to be witness to this on this morning. Um, how lucky I am to be here on this planet, um, you know, seeing something this beautiful because there are a lot of other places that I could have been <laughs> that weren't, wouldn't have been as, um, as enlightening, I would say. Um, I think this is the last one. Um, this is, again, seeing in shapes, seeing in values, seeing in textures. Um, and trying to create a sense of patterns and movement. And then, of course, the light takes care of the rest. The light is the thing that just 
brings anything to life. It, it adds that extra sense of, uh, of, of wonder or awe or um, that, that just that magic. So light really is the, the, the key ingredient in, in, uh, in, um, in any composition. In this case, it, it plays a very important role. And I converted to black and white because of what I just highlighted, which is because it was about textures and shapes and the value contrast and just the purity of the light then there was some color here but the color really didn't in fact i thought the color distracted the color took away from just this simplistic version of the play of light on the landscape and how the light is kind of playing these intervals so that not every single peak or every single shape has the same amount of light on it um, Here's an image where I went from this to that. Um, even though this was my original idea, but by simplifying it, I think I, I, I strengthened or concentrated just the very simplest essence of what I found about uh, interesting about the moment, which is just the warmth of the light on the sand. And just the variation and the colors going into the distance. There's contrast and color here, cool in the back, warm in the foreground. There's the textures in the foreground leading you into the background. And then as we get into the distance, there's um, softer values, not as strong as the values in the front with the ridges in the foreground. And of course, you know, leading lines uh, everywhere. So before we end, I want to mention, or I want to just share five mistakes. Um, I, I'll call them, you know, I, 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 I'm calling them five mistakes, but uh, I also want to emphasize that I think these are areas for growth. So when I see this in my students, I don't say, hey, you're making a mistake. I say, hey, here's how you can improve this. Here's how this is what you can do to get better. This is an area that I think you can improve in. So these are the things that I have noticed. The first is not using the edges of the frame effectively. That's an area that all of us can get better at. I see um, many, many, many students almost, I don't want to say ignore, but somehow they, as uh, as the picture gets to the edges of the frame, they give it less importance. Like, it doesn't really matter out there. What matters is what's more in the center. And that couldn't be furthest from the truth. Every single part of the frame is important. I would say that the edges of the frame, especially when you're learning, the edges of the frame are more important than what's in the middle because the edges define the boundary of your picture and it defines what's going to be in the picture and how the things are going to relate to one another. That I'm not saying that doesn't mean that you can't um, uh, cut through things or you can't you know have something cut off. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with how those things are going to relate with something else. If you have something that's cut off on the left, well, I can't just tell you that it's right or wrong. I have to see the entire context of the picture to know whether it works or it doesn't work. So it depends on the entire composition. But using the edges of the frame are very important for creating leading lines, for creating depth, for uh, uh, creating areas of shadow that move the eye towards light. The second one is not simplifying enough. I think that's been a common theme in the presentation tonight. Um, I can think of maybe a handful of times, maybe less, a handful of times when I've told the student that their image was too simple, when they needed to include more. But the times, uh, but the majority of the time, I'm usually suggesting, suggesting to exclude, to leave out, to simplify. <clears throat> a third thing that I think uh, we can all improve on is making images dynamic, getting them away from being static. Um, the way you do that is, again, through variation, through differences, through contrasts of different things, whether it's texture, passive versus of active areas, color, etc. Some of the examples that I've shown you here about creating uh, differences. Fourth is awareness of light. Uh, as I mentioned in that picture where uh, with the sand, I had to be very, very aware of what was going on with the light, what the light was doing, and by light that implies shadow you don't have light without shadow and vice versa so i see uh, a fair amount of students that want we all want to capture light and we all are aware of it but the awareness is not being used uh, 
compositionally necessarily. You're capturing light, but the light is kind of out of control. Sometimes it goes off to the edge of the frame. Sometimes it starts, we have bright edges around the frame. Getting that more in control means that we use the light in a way that works compositionally. And that has a lot to do with being aware of everything that's happening, particularly on the edges of the frame. And last is um, lack of a clear narrative about the image or knowing, knowing what you want to say. Um, I, I know this is a, perhaps a contentious or a, uh, something that everyone agrees with. I don't think that it needs to be thought of so rigidly. I don't think it needs to be thought of as you have, you know, like a, a, a specific narrative. But you should have an idea about what it is you're trying to capture. You should have a, a clear idea about something that compels you to make the image. If you're just pressing the button because the button is there, <laughs> okay, or because you just think that it might be might make a good image, but you're not quite sure what about the image you like or what it is that you like about the image, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's It only becomes a problem when you're then trying to capture an image that conveys something. If you're not sure, that's fine. But that's an area for growth. That's where you need to ask yourself and become more self-aware, become more um, introspective. What? Why am I here? Why am I photographing the landscape? What, are, what, what is it that I really like? What is it that um, attracts me? Um, what motivates me to go o out over and over with my camera? And those answers, I think, will help you to be more intentional about, about making pictures. So one last quote, you, uh, you have to get away from relying only on the subject. Light is the imagination's main tool. It is something you work with in defining everything you want to, whether subject or landscape. Um, and that's by the great and amazing photographer, David Winch, one of my, one of my uh, all-time uh, influences. So a few questions that I'm just going to answer here. Um, uh, sharp background then flows into a soft background, effective in creating depth. Uh, sure, uh, as I mentioned before, any anything, generally speaking, and I have to speak generally because um, everything is relative to the picture. So I would have to look at an example of, a, of an image to see exactly what you meant by that. But anytime you can create variation, soft in the foreground, a little bit more textured in the background, or vice versa, that's going to create movement because, again, your eye always, the, the human eye, our eye always wants to look for differences in things. If we see something sharp or textured we want we're going to see if there's something that's different around it um, and so any variation is going to be great um, what compels you to process an image to black and white well i think I, I i alluded to that a little bit when i talked about the black and white image before but what compels me is this uh, idea of um, simplifying an image to the bare essence that includes color. More often than not, the color tends to be something that I want to have in the image because I think it is a part of the composition. It's a part of what makes it strong. But when I find that an image gets stronger when I remove the color, like in the few examples that I showed you today, then I will do that. When the color dilutes the image, then I, th then I, then I know or I, f I have a feeling that uh, doing it in black and white will be better. Now, some photographers only want to work in black and white some only want to work in color that's perfectly fine i mean it's whatever you decide whatever gives you the most enjoyment and whatever gives you the best opportunity to express yourself that's all that matters it doesn't matter what whether you like color or black and white i'm open to either or although 90 percent of what i do is in color but i love great black and white pictures maybe um, I find the best black and white pictures very difficult to make, and so I, I shy away from them, perhaps. But um, I think that they have a place and a role in, in my work, and so I think you can make that decision for yourself as well. Um, when do you use this rule of thirds? Um, I think I use the rule of thirds all the time, whether it's implicit or not, or whether it's intentional or not, or whether I even realize it. Um, does that mean that every picture that I make... Well, let me rephrase that. I will start 
with the rule of thirds, if I feel like I need something to sort of guide me, something to get started with, right? Like, like some kind of grounding. I don't have to stay with the rule of thirds. I don't have to, um, it's, I'm not a slave to it. It's just a handy guide, a shortcut, if you will. But I have many images where the rule of thirds is not really that clear. I have images where I've put the horizon line right in the center. Um, not a lot, but I have enough. And I know why I did that, because I felt as though the balance in the image, the symmetry in the, in the image was broken by something else. So when you put the horizon line in the center, generally that creates the symmetry between top and bottom, and generally we want differences, right? Those two spaces are the same, we want them to be different, generally speaking. But if I have something else in the image that breaks that symmetry, and it might be something like trees or something that creates a stronger sense of the differences rather than the horizon line, then that'll work. So again, everything is relative, everything is in question of balance. But I think the rule of thirds, it's a, it's a, it's a good rule that generally tends to work. But like, you know what they say about rules, right? You can break them when you have a better idea. Um, do you find that using a tripod helps you when composing a photograph? Absolutely. I have been using tripods since I started. Um, that's not to say that I don't make images handheld. I don't have any kind of, you know, um, dogmatic uh, um, suggestion about tripods. I think as a practical matter, tripods do two things for you. One is they allow you to make images where you can't hold the camera steady enough when you're using low shutter speed. So blurring clouds, blurring water, uh, long exposure. So they're practical in that sense. If you um, are wanting to um, accelerate your compositional skills, using a tripod is invaluable. And the reason is because when you use a tripod, you are forced, I shouldn't say forced, it's much more difficult to jump around from one composition to another. You're more likely to stay in one area and continue to make these little fine refinements and adjustments to the image. And that is what is required to make good composition. Very rarely will a photographer just point the camera and make a perfect composition. There are slight little adjustments that are being made. Even Ansel Adams talks about how these little adjustments, moving the camera left or right up and down, would change fundamentally the composition. And if you're on a tripod, it's much easier to do that because you make a picture, you reconsider. When you look through the viewfinder again, it's the same composition. You haven't moved it. If you're handheld, you now you have to come back to the exact position that you were in, and that takes some experience. So I think it's very helpful, and I think it's still very helpful in that it slows you down. And I think slowing down in the landscape is one of the best things you can do. Um, currently, what are your favorite camera bodies and lenses for landscape photography? Um, well, that is not an area of expertise for me. Um, I think, honestly, that any of the modern cameras that are out there, whether from Canon or Nikon or Panasonic or Fuji or Sony, are going to do great. Um, I just spent a week, uh, a few weeks ago in Death Valley with my 13-year-old uh, Canon 1DS Mark III. I had a great time. And I made, I made in images that I enjoyed. So... There's lots of great options out there for new gear, but it's not necessarily what's going to make an image that resonates with somebody else. Um, uh, last question, teaching schedule this year. Yeah, so I'm still kind of mapping that out trying to decide what I'm going to be doing. I will be going to Acadia in June, uh, and I'm going to Death Valley in November. Those are two workshops that I'll be doing this year for sure. Um, other than that, I'm not sure. What I can tell you is that I do want to do more of these kinds of things, um, more webinars, uh, maybe do some virtual workshops where I'm interacting with as many people as possible, sharing ideas. I think for the next... Uh, webinar that I do. I'll announce that soon, but I definitely want to do something where I'm continuing the conversation that we've had tonight, uh, but continuing it in Lightroom, really, which is my other sort of area that I really enjoy working. Not because I like editing pictures per se, but I like using Lightroom in a very creative way to emphasize and to interpret images using these principles. When you understand 
how visual cues work, then you can use the tools in Lightroom to emphasize those cues, to, uh, to strengthen the image in a way that uh, makes the viewer more interested and makes the compositions stronger. So dodging and burning becomes not a random thing or not a let's see what happens, but it becomes a very intentional thing where you're dodging and burning in areas that are going to emphasize the differences in value that already exist in your picture. And by doing that, you strengthen the picture, you make the composition much more, um, uh, much stronger and more effective. All right, so I think that's it for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun for me. Thank you once again for joining me. Appreciate it. And uh, you'll hear from me soon. Take care. Have a good night.